Hi everyone and welcome to the next video from Kiligar Chess. We're having a quick departure from the best games of all time as my friends over at Online Chess Lessons and I have agreed to do a game of each other's as a one-off favour. You can link to their site from my main page on YouTube. One of the top guys there is Chess Master William Stewart rated 2219 at the time of this tournament game in December last year where he played Mario Villanueva rated 23.72. Stuart had white and open with knight f3 which is the flexible reti opening that has huge transpositional potential of course because knight f3 features in many openings and Villanueva answered with knight f6 which is equally flexible and non-committal regarding central pawn structure. Next came b3 aiming of course to Fianchetto in hypermodern style which both players adopted for the opening after g6 from Villeneuve and bishop b2 and bishop g7 and now g3 and so far Stuart has claimed firm control over the central dark squares with his pieces without advancing his center pawns too far in classic hypermodern style this move d3 is rarely played at this stage of the opening so perhaps it's one of his pet lines or with some home preparation for the tournament in any case it looks solid now Villeneuve castled and Stuart played knight bd2 and you know both sides are playing solidly and taking as few risks as possible so d6 and black now has a king's indian setup but the normal theory of the opening isn't applicable given White's development. So g3 and Stuart aims to Fianchetto kingside also so we will have one of the double Fianchetto openings and e5 from Villeneuve. Finally one side stakes a claim to the center with a pawn and you know this contests White's dark square control but at least for the moment the position is dynamically balanced and neither side can claim much of an advantage. Bishop g2, knight c6. Black has fairly easy piece development given that white's central pawns have remained relatively unadvanced. So castles, and now knight h5, which is presumably preparing a later f5, although uh, this move didn't come for some time. And Stuart now inhibited it with e4 and Villeneuve answered bishop g4 which is pinning the f3 knight. Um, f5 right away look good too for example f5 e takes f5 bishop takes f5 and black has two center pawns against one and the open f file to work with overall giving a small edge but nothing game winning or anything like that yet. So bishop g4 is the game continuation and now h3 kicking the bishop to e6 and now rook e1 because this e file may become open or at least semi open quite soon and so this move makes sense and also allows knight f1 to e3 or h2 in uh, king's indian attack style so now h6 which you know the thinking behind it is to prevent knight g5 after queen d7 uh, which is coming next for pressure on h3 so knight f1, queen d7, attacking h3, king h2 to defend it. And now king h7 from Villeneuve, which was a curious move that I don't fully understand, I have to admit. I think it's probably the beginning of a plan that never came to fruition, like rook h8 and some kind of kingside initiative. Black wants to play f5 here, but he's unable to at the moment because the knight will be a tactical liability from the queen. For example, if instead of king h7, f5, now e takes f5, g takes f5, white would have knight takes e5 with this discovered attack on the loose h5 knight. And if instead bishop takes a f5, sorry, then g4 is good for white, although it doesn't win a piece because here would come knight f4. Then after g takes f5, knight takes g2, king takes g2, e4 attacking the uh, knight and also the loose bishop on b2 is going to win the piece back but white is still better after f6 he takes f3 and queen
queen takes f3, where black has little compensation for the pawn he's lost. So, king h7, anyway, is what Villeneuve played. And now came d4 from Stuart, which is, you know, another advantage of playing this knight f1 move is supporting this central push, which Stuart judged as best to play at this moment and showed good judgment in doing so. So e takes d4, knight takes d4, and some exchanges in the center. And after these exchanges, white can claim the center fully. You know, he's got a piece planted here that's supported. And that's definitely a claim to some advantage. And black has to look for counterplay, which he did with the thematic f5 push. However, this only adds to white's advantage. Better with simply rook a, e8. So e takes f5 and rook takes f5, which allows b7 to drop. But instead of going for the material, Stuart opted for bishop e4, which is another nice centralizing move that sets up some tactics involving the pin that's going to exist on this pawn after the rook moves, combined with the pressure on the knight from the queen. Stuart chose exactly the right moment to open up the game, it appears, and all of a sudden, from a flank-based Fianchetto opening, White's pieces have come dangerously alive. The pressure proved too much for Villeneuve, and he blundered immediately with the rook b5. His best hope was an exchange sack with queen f7. For example, bishop takes f5, if indeed white wants to accept the sacrifice, which may be very dangerous given the light squares around his king. After queen takes f5, queen takes h3 is threatened, and best play appears to be king g1, and now queen takes h3, bishop takes g7, knight takes g7, where black has reasonable positional compensation for the material deficit. So, rook b5. If you want to try and spot why this is a blunder, then stop the video now. a4 is the reason why. It's a very nice move, and it gives white a big edge, and uh, you'll see why in a moment. Black's problem is that his rook is tied to defending the h5 knight from the queen, as I mentioned, and he's now faced with the prospect of continual pawn pushes from white until his rook is forced off this fifth rank after which the knight is lost. Accepting his dilemma, Villeneuve played bishop takes d4 which means he doesn't lose a piece but he faces a game winning attack after the smoke clears for, uh, of these uh, tactical complications. He'll have to play this move anyway but there was no reason not to provoke a few pawn weaknesses first. For example he could have played instead rook a5, and after b4, rook g5, f4, and now sacrifice his knight, resulting in a slightly better position than the game continuation after g takes f4, bishop takes d4, and queen takes d4, the best move from white. And here Villeneuve would have rook h5 with some initiative and counterplay on the h3 pawn. Psychologically, however, it's very hard to go a piece down willingly, and so he chose instead to allow an attack on his king with the game continuation. Bishop takes d4. Because now comes a takes b5, and after bishop takes a1, queen takes h5, discovers an attack on the a1 bishop, so it has to be saved with bishop g7, and black, as I said, doesn't drop a piece, but he is worse off now compared to the variation we just saw, thanks to queen takes g6 check, forcing king g8, and now rook e3 with the monstrous threat of rook f3, more or less forcing bishop f7. But now comes queen h7 check, king f8, and rook f3, threatening bishop d5 and exploiting this pin but perhaps stronger was bishop takes b7 where best play goes rook b8, bishop c6, queen d8 and now rook f3 and there are too many threats for black to deal with the most serious being again bishop d5 and also queen g6 to exploit this pin 
and queen g5 would tackle both of these but now comes rook f5 forcing the queen to move and now bishop d5 and so completely winning attack so rook f3 anyway and Villeneuve defended with rook e8 which is you know the best defense available but white is still totally winning after bishop d5 and black has to play rook e7 but the pin on the bishop is going to cost the game and Stuart now capitalized on it with queen g6 okay that's the end of part one